century, 1977, I was on, uh, down in a little town south, south, south Georgia called Lyons, Georgia. I was uh, a co-op engineering student and was attending the First Baptist Church of Lyons, Georgia. A couple that I had befriended, we had become really good friends, and this was back before we had discovered that for children to grow spiritually, it's really best for them to be in worship with the adults, but this was sort of at the beginning of that, and so it was a children's church time, and so they had, uh, they would take the children out in the old sanctuary, which was one of those sort of uh, semicircular round ones uh, where you came in at the top and you walked, everything was downhill, you know, down to the front. And uh, so the story, they, they were telling me the week before, the story is uh, about uh, David and Goliath. We want you, Stan, to dress up like Goliath. And, and we're going to kind of be telling this story. We'll have them right down front. And, it, and when we get to that point where Goliath steps out and, and challenges the Philistines, you come in from the back and you raise your spear and your voice and you challenge the Philistines. I mean, challenge the Israelites. I said, man, yeah. And we were practicing, and everything was just great. And we had those children down there, and they had them, because they were very good storytellers, this, this couple. They were wonderful with this. And so they were just, and the kids were there, and at just the right time. Hey! I stepped out, and I looked like six cubits in a span when those kids turned around. I mean, I was a giant to them. And that was all I got out. Because in that moment, those children became the Israelites and scattered to the four winds. They, there was only three of us, and, and I was Goliath. So, so these kids, I mean, they were running all over that old sanctuary. They were diving under the pews. They were running into the baptistry. They were everywhere. And we sort of spent the rest of the time just collecting children and, and bringing them back. And I'm in tears running. And I thought, surely. I mean, now I would be afraid that I would be sued for emotional damage to children. You know how that is. David and Goliath. It is one, if not the most beloved, big story of all big stories. Since its inception, people have cherished, cherished this story. It is indeed the father of all underdog stories. You will hear it. You will probably hear it next week when the balls play the tide. But this is the real underdog story. Two armies camped on either side of a valley. And it was not uncommon in that day and time for sometimes for armies to send out a single warrior and to engage in single warrior battle. And whoever won sort of won the battle. So the Philistines sent out Goliath, largest, strongest, long experienced in warfare. And they knew it. And who did Israel send out? That was the question. Didn't have a soul, not one. Not one warrior of Israel until the day that David shows up bringing some lunch to his brothers and David hears this boy as both Saul and Goliath call him this this boy who had zero experience in war this boy who we find later on can hardly even move in real warrior armor never trained with a spear and a sword David steps up to say I will but David has a special background, something if we're not careful we may miss. For as a shepherd, he is used to protecting the flock against these renegade animals. David certainly knows he's not tough as a bear, nor is he strong as a lion. But what David did know in those days was what he said in verse 37. God has saved me. God has rescued me. God has delivered me from something way stronger way more fierce than I. It was this shepherd lifestyle that began to help David realize something in the midst of this giant on the other side of the valley that everyone else had forgotten. For you see, David had spent a lifetime of practicing the presence 
of God. Yes, there were moments of lions and bears and other threats to the sheep. But mostly, being a shepherd was day after day after day after day of standing there with sheep. Not a lot going on. And so David has the opportunity to watch and to observe and to listen and to meditate. As he will say later on in the most beloved psalm, shepherding is a lot like spending an enormous amount of time beside still waters. And it is in those moments that David does not waste. It is in those moments that David pays attention to God. How much of the life of faith is like that? Day after day, not of fighting lions and bears and giants, those days come. But mostly it's day after day after day of quiet, patient practice of God's presence. And not just God's presence in the world, but God's presence in our lives. Since the church began, those who have been interested in knowing God, following God, and being used of God have engaged in this practice of the presence of God. Now, when I say the word practice, what does that call to mind? That there's something going on. Jonathan and David don't play these instruments simply because they just one day picked it up and said, oh, okay, here it goes. I mean, they're gifted, and maybe they did a little bit of that. But I know them, and I know they practice. And I know day after day they're working to get those fingers nimble and to figure out so that ultimately it's just second thought to them. You see, there is something that we can do day after day after day to be ready when the giants come. Because if we just wait until the giants come, we're not ready. And so the spiritual disciplines, we talk about them all the time. But there is a reason they are important in our life. On those days when it doesn't seem like there's much going on at all. Well, God, this is going to be a good day. I really don't need to read scripture. I don't need to meditate. I don't need to be thinking. I don't need to find a way to serve today. And God, it's really been kind of a quiet month. So, in terms of worship, I really, you know, I'm okay. Thank you, God, for being at worship today, but I'm okay today, so I will be somewhere else. And God, I really have so many friends. I don't need to fellowship with my Christian friends. I'm service. I don't know if you've missed it or seen it, but it's been sitting up here how long, Jason? A year or more? Summertime. It's hard to get in shape spiritually if you only work out on Sunday. And the average says you're only working out on Sunday once or twice a month. That's what the average church attendance is now. How can we be prepared to face the giants if we've never taken the time to practice and be ready? David knew long before he ever got to Goliath that God was with him. And so he speaks to Saul and he says, Saul, I can do it. I've killed lions, I've killed bears, and the strength of God, this is no problem. And Saul is convinced by David's speech, and so he outfits David with his own armor and his own weapons. I love telling this story in Wee Chapel, and, and especially I'll wait till I'm in the winter, and I'll take in my big leather heavy coat, and 
I'll say, okay, I need a David to come up here, and I'll get one of the kids, and I'll put that coat on them, and I'll say, now do something funny. You ought to see him wheeling that coat around. Their arms are just flailing in the, you know. And I said, it doesn't fit him, does it? And I said, that's what happened with David and Saul. They tried to get David to wear human armor, and that is where Saul had a mistaken idea that Goliath could be defeated by human strength. You see, once again, we've gotten the cart before the horse. We say, God, we figured this out, so just take a break, God. Really, take a rest, God. We've got this. You remember last week, we talked about one nation under, well, a king, and that's what they wanted. We want a king to be like everybody else. We want to be like the nations, not light to the nations. And we want a king, by the way, go back and read that, who will what? Fight for us. Well, what happens when the king who was elected to fight for you is scared to death? You don't have a nation under God. You have a nation under a king. And when a nation is under a king, it depends on human abilities, military might, and economics. But when a nation is under God, well, they are under God. And they live by God's decrees and they live by God's rules. Doesn't make sense according to all the other nations. But that's why they are a God and a nation under God. And in the end, when you are a nation under a king... You are deeply afraid. Did you hear that? The whole army. But David finally steps up and again, going back to his day-to-day existence with God, he understands, wait a minute, this armor is not going to protect me. These weapons are not going to protect me. God will go with me. And so David goes out clothed in his everyday walk with God. And in the courage and strength of God, it does what multitude of warriors before him have tried to do and fail. He defeats Goliath. So the whole arc of this story is to say that what really ultimately brought Goliath down was not simply David's skill with the slingshot nor the precise flight of the rock. Rather, it was the work of God through David. Now, his skills are not insignificant. David was not only day after day after day practicing the presence of God. He's practicing that slingshot, you know, setting up old clay jars (laughs) on that tree. Pow, pow, pow. And God didn't just mysteriously give Goliath a cerebral hemorrhage. The whole point of David's confidence was not his talents, but was the presence and the work of God in Israel. As David will say in verse 47, All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear, not anything that humans are good at, that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. That begs the question, this whole army's been there for a while. They've been out under the leadership of the king and up walks this young man one day with lunch for his brothers. Why then does it seem that David is the only one who remembers that God is in the battle? It's the same story that we read that Ginger read for us in the New Testament. Here's Jesus, God embodied. Sleeping, the disciples have seen Jesus do some incredible things. And so he's asleep and there's this storm. Do they remember that God in their history has done some incredible things? Do they remember that the Jesus who's sitting right in the back of the boat has done some incredible things? Evidently not. God awake, aren't you? Why are you not caring that we're going to die? The Israelites were unaware of Yahweh's power over someone as big as Goliath. The disciples 
are unaware of Jesus' power over a big storm in the Sea of Galilee and on it has gone throughout history. It seems that the people of God have trouble with remembering the power of God and the ability of God to take care of his people. And so I ask us all a question, what kind of difference would it make in the life of the church, our church? What kind of difference would it make in your life if more of us had the kind of firm faith in God's ability to take care of God's own children? You see, this moment in this big story is not so much about David and Goliath, but about the fact that Israel was at a critical moment. They've already, in our story last week, rejected God verbally. And now they're doing it physically. They had a wonderful past. Moses and Exodus, Joshua, they've come into the land. They've moved from a nomadic tribe to a nation with borders. The judges helped for a while and thinking they would need to be like everybody else. They chose a king and now here they are with a giant breathing down their neck. And Israel is afraid. Really? One person? Even though there's six cubits in a span? Do you not remember God defeated a whole army in Egypt? Do you not remember God was with us in the desert as we wandered around? Do you not remember that God drove out many nations and many armies and helped us to overtake many fortified cities and now we're cowering on the side of a hill because one giant? So Israel has to face this question. Are they going to be shaped by their fears of the giants? Or are they going to be shaped by God's love? And David steps in in that critical moment and reminds Israel, we are God's children. And so I wonder then, this great story that is a marvelous story about a young boy and a giant, but maybe it says something to us about being the people of God, more importantly. And I wonder if it's part of the nature of our life in Christian community to remind each other that while the life of faith may at times be much harder than we bargain for, those children were absolutely terrified when I stepped out of the back of that sanctuary. And as far as they were concerned, I was coming to get them. There are days we wake up and we have reason to initially be terrified. But is it our task in fellowship, in worship, in service together to remind each other that God does not abandon us. Not to the storms of life or even to the gale force winds of our own fears, but rather God comes, stilling the wind and the state and the waves, calming our fear ridden hearts, telling us again and again and again that we are God's own beloved children and calling us to a greater faith. And when we do that with each other, when we comfort each other with the news of God's steadfast love, we are playing one of the greatest roles assigned and described all throughout Scripture. For at critical moments in the biblical story from Genesis to Revelation, angels and individuals have been sent to the people of God to say these four very powerful yet simple words. Do not be afraid. And each time that we say those words to each other and we hear them from each other, we join with all the saints before who, caught up in the Spirit of God, find the courage not just to survive, but to flourish. Not just to live, but to live with abundance. Not just to get by, to dare great things, to expect great things, 
to ask for great things and to share great things. The Israelites had one giant. Friends, there are giants coming out of the hills all around us these days. But remember, the battle is the Lord's. Father, we come this day thanking you for these great stories. Thank you, God, for David who having spent day after day after day with you when he actually encountered the giant, no big deal. For he knew you were with him. 